Let's sit down. <laughs> It was a great turnout. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Reed Simmons. Um, I'm better known as Finn's uh, thesis advisor. Uh, despite my best intentions, he graduated in 1997 and left us for an illustrious career starting at Georgia Tech and now at the uh, University of Southern California. Uh, Sven does his research in uh, decision making, planning for single and multi agents smart and autonomous systems acting under uncertainty. Um, he is uh, very, very busy outside of research. Uh, in addition to being uh, uh, NSF program officer several years ago, um, he is, let me see if I got this all right, he co-founded both uh, RSS and the SOX conferences, was program chair of too many conferences to, to enumerate is chair of uh, SIG AI, the ACM Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence, associate editor of many journals, and um, yeah, and he does really groundbreaking research. I'm very pleased to have him back at Carnegie Mellon and uh, uh, welcome him to give his presentation. Okay, yeah, it's great to be back. Thank you. So what's really surprising to me is that when 20 years ago, you know, I left uh, CMU, I cleaned up my homepage a little bit, but then I let it sit and it's still there. So you can still Google, you know, Sven König at, at CMU and this old homepage comes up. And in case you're interested, this is how I looked back then. Okay? <laughs> and uh, since we are celebrating Manuela to tomorrow, uh, so this is me, um, this is her, had long hair back then. Um, but what the talk today is all about is really about uh, multi-robot pathfinding, and it's about a different person. Um, this guy here, who knows who that is? Okay, bunch of folks, right? Glenn Wagner um, finished his dissertation here not too long ago, and it was on multi-robot pathfinding, and he was runner-up for Best ICAPS Dissertation Award uh, this year. And so in a way, I was fortunate enough that I was on his dissertation committee. I learned a whole lot um, about multi-agent uh, pathfinding from him. And so now what this talk is about is sort of what we figured out uh, about the topic, very complementary uh, to what he did. But in case you, you missed any talks by Glenn, let me start at the very beginning in this talk here. So what is multi-agent pathfinding? So this is a boring slide, or hopefully one of the few ones. So, so the problem is that you're given a number of agents. Uh, every agent has a start in a goal location in a known environment. And you want to find collision-free paths for the agents from the start to the goal locations um, and paths that minimize some objective. And that could be make span. So you want to minimize the latest arrival time of an agent at its goal location, or maybe flow time. You want to minimize the sum of the arrival times of all agents at the goal location. So here's an example, right? Simple environment. You know exactly how the environment looks like. Um, you have two robots on, on this side. Uh, you want to get them to the corresponding locations on that side. Right? And the problem is that if you plan independently for these robots, then, of course, each one of the robots uh, needs to move to the right. So if that happens, right, then at this point here, uh, the blue robot reaches its goal location, and it blocks the green robot from reaching its goal location. So that doesn't quite work. So you need to plan somehow for both of these robots simultaneously. And if you do that, then you will figure out that the blue robot here needs to move into the alcove, lets the green robot pass, and then they eventually can move on to their goal locations. But that means that you really need to plan for, for sets of robots, right? And that makes the planning problem likely hard, because the more robots you have, the larger the state space. So why do we care about this? And do we really care about planning for large numbers of robots? And the answer is yes, we do. And uh, sort of the standard example that everybody will show you here is these uh, Kiva warehouses now part of, of Amazon, so Amazon Robotics. And I'm sure that you have seen them before, um, but, but just in case, right, I mean, there's sort of a large uh, warehouse area. There's really a small model of this. Um, and then there's sort of picking stations at this point, right, still humans. Uh, but, but this part here is meant to be completely autonomous in that you have stored the goods on shelves, uh, like this one here. If you order a teddy bear, then a robot goes into the warehouse, it picks up the whole shelf that contains the teddy bear, it brings that to a picking station. A human at this point in time will, will pick up the teddy bear, uh, puts it into a package for you, uh, sends it off, 
and then the robot brings the whole shelf back into the warehouse, either at the same place or a different place in the warehouse. So one of the issues that you have in these warehouses is that you want to utilize almost all of the space that you have for shelves, right? Because you want to store as many goods as you can. And because of this, these corridors here are very, very narrow. So if there are two robots, uh, both carrying shelves, they cannot pass each other. So it's sort of a problem that you need to keep in mind. And just to show you that, um, I just got this from YouTube here. So you see uh, how narrow these, these corridors are. And I think here you see, you know, it's exactly one robot with a shelf uh, that fits through these corridors. So uh, we have large numbers of, of robots, um, large installations, uh, multi-hundred, more than a thousand robots uh, per installation. And you need to figure out how should they move in the warehouse simultaneously so as not to, to block each other. Now, one of the applications that we are also interested in is these autonomous tech robots. So it's joint work with NASA Ames. And so the idea here is that, um, that um, aircraft shouldn't really taxi with their engines from the runway uh, to the gate, right? Because um, that uh, needs a ton of energy. It creates a ton of, of pollution. So what some airports are already doing, you might have seen this, if you pay attention next time you know you take a flight to somewhere, is um, they have sort of these car-like um, uh, type vehicles and they tow the, the airplanes not just in the gate area but over longer distances. Right? So that reduces pollution and, and energy consumption. And so the idea of NASA Ames then is, well, what if we could automate this, right? We, we don't need human drivers, right? There's still a human sitting here. Uh, we don't need human drivers any longer. We let a robot do it. Um, then also we can reduce human danger, reduce human workload, and we might be able to reduce safety distances uh, between planes. And because of this, we might be able to reduce the footprint of an airport. So that's the idea. And so um, similar to what we have seen before, um, lots of, of, of airplanes um, maneuver at the same time at an airport. Uh, the, the sort of routes that they have um, are quite narrow. Um, and of course, they shouldn't collide. So now you have seen sort of two multi-robot pathfinding problems on, on real robots. And we need to solve them. We want to plan for the robots. How should they move in the environment? How do we do it? Now, this is where I need to admit that I'm in the wrong place here because it turns out that I'm not a real roboticist. Okay? I really feel that I'm much, much more sort of like an AI researcher uh, who often applies some of the planning algorithms that we develop uh, to robots. So how do you think as an AI researcher about this? So somehow, these are difficult planning problems. Um, we need to figure out what the structure of these planning problems is in order to solve them. So we need to make simplifying assumptions. And so what I will do is I will model the environment here as a grid. So I'll assume that I have point robots available, no kinematic constraints, you know, discretized environment as, as a grid. And I will plan on that. It has also the advantage that if you need to write a simulator, you can do this with, uh, you know, 100 lines of code and you're done. Okay, and so by the way, for, for Amazon, as you might know, the first thing that, that Amazon does when it moves into a new warehouse, it puts stickers on the ground. Uh, so it basically... Um, outlines these grid cells. Right? So this way, uh, you don't really need to worry too much about uh, localization error and these kinds of things. So just for completeness here, on the way we model this on a grid is each agent moves north, east, south, and west into an adjacent unblocked cell. It's not allowed that the two agents move into the same cell, right? They would collide here in a cell which corresponds to the vertex of the underlying grid graph. So we call this a vertex collision. It's also not allowed that in this situation here, this robot moves to here and this robot moves to there. They would collide here um, on the boundary of the cells, which corresponds to an edge in the grid graph, right? So this is an edge collision. And one assumption that we make here is that the robots could move very, very slowly in a circle. It's not really necessary, um, but I'm just mentioning this for, for precision, you know, for the experimental results that we'll see in a second. Okay, so how difficult is the problem? That's the first question that we need to ask ourselves. Maybe it's an easy problem, then we don't need to worry too much about it. And, you know, we knew for, for a long time that multi-agent pathfinding, and I will, in, in this talk, probably, hopefully, the only abbreviation that I will use, MAPF. I might from time to time say MAPF, and then you substitute multi-agent pathfinding for it, okay? So multi-agent pathfinding is NP hard to solve optimally for mix span and flow time minimization. Um, and one way how you can, can convince yourself of this is these toys here, right? I mean, that we love from, 
from EI classes, the 15 puzzle in this particular case, you can view this as a multi-agent pathfinding problem where every tile is a robot, right? And then getting all of the robots to, to the right places, that's the multi-agent pathfinding problem. And here sort of one tile blocks lots of other tiles. That's why it's a hard problem. So this is NP-hard. And then there's a recent result. Uh, you know, this comes from our own research group and our collaborators. And it says that uh, multi-agent pathfinding is also NP-hard to approximate within any factor less than 4 over 3 for mixed band minimizations on graphs in general. Okay, so this is <coughs> still, if you have theoreticians here, right, we could improve this because we don't know whether it's, it's NP-hard on grids. Uh, it's only NP-hard on graphs in general, so maybe the hard graphs are non-grids. Uh, we also, also uh, only have this, uh, this result for mixed band minimization and not for flow time minimization. Okay? So if you have theoreticians here, that's something to work on. But what this suggests is that not just finding optimal solutions, but also bounded suboptimal solutions might be NP-hard. Right? Bounded suboptimal, I mean a constant factor away from the best solution quality that you can achieve. Um, how do you prove these things? I, I, I don't want to sort of belabor this. Um, it's usually reductions from sometimes esoteric versions of satisfiability problems, right? And, and they result then in sort of multi-agent pathfinding uh, graphs that look like this. Okay, fine. Um, how do we solve this? It's NP-hard. In AI, we always solve NP-hard problems, so that doesn't scare us a whole lot. But we now need to think about how to exploit the structure. If you know Glenn, um, you know M-star. I will give you a different approach here. Uh, this is an approach that comes from an Israeli research group, um, the research group of Arya Felner and his collaborators, and it's called conflict-based search. Um, the reason why I use that is very easy, and that makes it sort of easy to extend for us as well. So let's talk about how it works. So here we have a multi-agent pathfinding problem. There's nothing blocked here. In particular, this cell is not blocked, even though it's shaded in green. Um, you have uh, one robot here, and you want to get it to this cell. You have one robot here, and you want it to get it to this cell. How do you solve this problem? So first step is you plan for the robots independently. Every robot finds its shortest path from where it is to where it should be, not considering that there are other robots that also want to navigate in the same environment. So the red robot finds the red path, the blue robot finds the blue path. Now, if these paths are not in conflict, if there's no collision of robots, we have solved the problem, right? It's the minimum make span and minimum flow time, and we can stop. Unfortunately, in this case, at time two, uh, both the red robot and the blue robot are in this green cell here, and they collide. So it's not a good solution. So what do we do? Now, we know that both robots at time step two cannot be in the green cell. It's not allowed because they would collide. So we can split this into a disjunctive constraint, namely that the red robot at time step two cannot be in the green cell, and the constraint the blue robot at time step two cannot be in the green cell. And we know that an optimal solution satisfies at least one of the two constraints, maybe both. Right? So that's the idea. And so now that's what we're doing. Right? We're taking this situation here, we are splitting it into two. The red agent is not allowed to be in this, this X green cell here at time Two, um, here the blue robot is not allowed to be in that cell. Now, um, again, the robots will plan independently here from each other, but they need to take these constraints into account. So the blue robot doesn't need to replan. There's no new constraint for the blue robot, but the red robot does need to replan because here it was in, in the green cell at time two. It's no longer allowed to do that. It finds a different path. And if you think about it, finding this path is fast. Because all you do is you run Dijkst or any search method that you like in x, y, t space. Okay? And there, this constraint here just corresponds to a blocked cell. So very fast to do. So in this case, the red robot here uh, replans. Um, and unfortunately, now we have another collision here between the robots. So we will split this um, also in two situations and so on. So we get a search tree. And what these guys figured out here is how can you search this search tree very, very quickly and still guarantee that you find either the optimal solution or a bounded suboptimal solution. Okay? So we use the bounded suboptimal planner because the problems are so hard that we feel that we need to trade off a little bit runtime for solution quality. Okay? So we use a bounded suboptimal solver that does exactly that. 
So that's cool, right? Because I could tell you about this particular algorithm in three minutes while you sit here and I think you, you got it. But you can also understand that the more collisions happen, so, so if you have a ton of collisions here, for example, right, and we resolve sort of one of them, probably still have a ton of collisions here. So if you have initially a ton of collisions between these different robots, then we need a lot of runtime for this algorithm uh, to address one after the other until we have no collisions any longer. So we want to avoid having a ton of collisions initially. How do we do it? And here we had an idea that comes from Mac Maxim Likachev's uh, research group here at, at Carnegie Mellon um, because uh, one of his students uh, and him, they were thinking about how can we do a bounded suboptimal single agent search so that the resulting path uses edges in a given subgraph as much as possible. Right, so I, I will call them here highway or you can call them lanes, right? But you give a couple of lanes, you want to find a path from A to B on a graph, how, how do we do it so that this path uses as much of the lanes as possible, but is still bounded suboptimal, right? So it makes, a, it makes a guarantee as to how bad the length of the path is compared to the length of the shortest path where you don't need to stick to these highway, these subgraph edges. So they figured out how to do it, and they have a very interesting solution. Um, I'll give you a much simpler solution here, uh, how you can do it. Um, and one way how you can do it is very simple, right? So if I have a single agent search problem here, find a, find a path from S to G that uses a lot of this, 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 this red highway there, how do I do it? A, a very simple way of how to do it is, well, so it's a graph search problem, looks like this. Um, every edge that's on the highway has a cost of one. Every edge that is not on the highway has a cost of four. Find a cost minimal path um, from S to G under that assumption. And then in your head now, you can prove very quickly, right? Well, you will find a path, and the, the cost of this path will be at most four times the cost of a shortest path. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Turns out Maxim does it in a different way. Uh, so if you don't know about experience graphs, uh, talk to Max. But our idea then was we can put these two things together for multi-agent pathfinding. And so, so the idea here is that if we have an environment like this one here, and we have a ton of robots that want to move from the left side to the right side, and a ton of robots that want to move from the right side to the left side, and every robot plans its shortest path, right? A bunch of robots you know, want to go from different sides through, through this gap here, and a bunch of robots uh, will move through this gap, so we have a ton of collisions. But if someone comes in like a human designer or learning algorithm and says, I want to have highways, not everywhere in the environment, but only here. One highway here that goes from right to left, one that goes from left to right, you know, try to find paths that stick to the highway. Now we have much, much more orderly conduct when passing through these gaps here that avoids a lot of initial collisions and conflict-based search will run much faster. So, so we think we can use highways, right, to speed up conflict-based search um, for finding multi-agent paths. So that's the idea. Um, it has other good advantages as well. Um, one thing is that these highways provide uh, consistencies and predictability of how robots move in the environment that might be important if they're human co-workers. So for example, for the airport example, can predict you know, how the planes will be towed uh, in the environment because you know, if they're on a highway, they will mostly move in the direction of the highway. And the other thing is that, that these highways don't make MAPF instances, multi-agent pathfinding instances unsolvable. So if a designer comes in and makes a mistake, Right, and says, that's the highways that you should use. And there's a bunch of robots that want to go from the left to the right and the other direction. You know, how, how do the robots on the left get to the right if these are hard constraints? It wouldn't work. But the algorithm guarantees bounded suboptimal solutions because it uses these highways only as suggestions, not as hard constraints. The runtime will be affected, right? We, we don't want that, uh, these kinds of highways, because the runtime would go up, um, but it still works. So let me show you how highways work. Again, a bunch of robots go from the left to the right. A bunch of robots want to go from the right to the left. You can see where the highways are, right? I mean, sort of one highway is this. Uh, the other highway is that. Um, so, so it's very orderly. Um, and we can still make these bounded suboptimal solution guarantees. OK, so this is sort of a small example here. Um, what if we look at sort of a somewhat larger example? Um, let's look at the, the warehouse example again. And it's very easy to come up with highways there as well. So here's sort of one possibility how the highways could look like. So the idea here is the first horizontal corridor from left to right, the next one from right to left, the one below that again from left to right, and so on. So human designer can come up with these highways uh, quite quickly. Uh, one question is, can we learn them, these highways? And we tried out 
two different kinds of things. I'll tell you about one of them. Uh, so we try to use graphical models. Graphical model, right? I mean, it's just sort of a probabilistic expert system, if you want to. Um, and so here's the, I'll, I'll just give you the idea. Um, so what we do is once we are confronted with a multi-agent pathfinding problem, um, we let every robot again plan the shortest path from where it is to where it wants to be. And then we look at the shortest path, and if we see lots of collisions in this cell here, for example, then maybe we want a highway there, right? Because a highway would prevent these collisions, hopefully, from happening. Okay, so let's assume that uh, through this cell, most of the paths go from bottom to top. Then maybe we want a highway in the cell that goes from bottom to top, like this highway here. And if we have a highway here that goes from bottom to top, then maybe we want in these two cells also to have highways that go from bottom to top so as to form longer lanes, just like we do in roadways. And similarly, if we have a highway here that goes from bottom to top, maybe here and here we want to have highways that go from top to bottom because this way, just like in roads, we have lanes in opposite direction next to each other. Right? And so whenever I said, if this holds, then maybe we want to do that, right? That you would encode as knowledge in sort of this graphical model. Uh, so these are constraints, right? And then you find something that does well according to these constraints. So that's basically sort of how it works. Um, and let me show you how this, uh, this eventually looks like, the, the learned highways. Uh, so here's again an example where a ton of robots want to go from left to right, a ton of robots want to go from right to left. So you can see sort of the learned highways. Uh, there are sort of some, so here it's not, not a whole highway, but for the most part, I mean, even though there are no only segments, for the most part, it's sort of recovered um, what a human designer might have done. And um, if, uh, if you try this out, because remember, these highways are there to make the multi-agent pathfinding faster. Right? Does it achieve that? Uh, so this is the number of robots here. This is how long multi-agent pathfinding runs uh, in order to find a path. The human-designed highways are this pink curve here. Uh, the computer-generated highways, the green curve. You can see the human-designed highways you know, make, make uh, conflict-based search run a little bit faster um, than the computer-designed ones, but it's pretty close. This is where I would stop if this was an advertising talk, but one thing I learned at CMU is, you know, also advertise when your stuff doesn't work, because maybe, you know, someone has a better idea. Um, so, so I'll show you a, a case where it works and a case where it doesn't work. Uh, so this is the case that we saw before, right, in the animation. Uh, so we learn highways of opposite direction. Uh, this one here is a similar case, highways of opposite direction. Uh, this one also you learn two highways in opposite direction. One case where this very, very simple graphical model fails is this one here. So we have a bunch of robots that want to go from this area to this area, and a bunch of robots that want to go from that area to this area. So what we should learn again is one highway, say, in this direction, the other highway in that direction. What we learn, and I know you can barely see this, we learn sort of a little segment here, a couple of stuff up there, but we don't learn these highways at all. So why not? And it's really two things responsible for this. One is that when the robot moves here, it moves in a staircase pattern, right? Up, right, up, right. But we didn't have a rule for up, right, up, right. We had a rule for consistently up, right? Or a rule for consistently, uh, consistently right, but not for up, right, up, right. So that's one problem. We could encode this, of course, but then it depends to some degree again on human ingenuity. And the other thing is that this path here is shorter than that. And so if every robot individually plans a shortest path, you know, from here to here and from here to here, most robots want to go either direction, right? Through this part here, almost no robot wants to go through this particular part here. So the system has no incentive to put highways here because there are no collisions among robots that plan their path individually. Okay. So I think you, know, you could make this, this graphical model more complex, but I'm sure that there must be other approaches you know, that do much better. We don't have them at this point. I think it's a low-hanging fruit. So I think if someone here needs an interesting class project, uh, you would probably come up with a better learning method than currently exists. So take that as a challenge. Okay, so um, you know, here's, here's how this looks like sort of in a larger simulation. So you can see you know, basically sort of the highways here. And how good does it work? So um, it works, but we can speed it up further. And so let me, let me briefly mention how we can speed it up. 
And again, there's a challenge for you because I think that there are many techniques that can be used uh, to make multi-agent pathfinding even faster. And faster is important because we want to run it in real time so that the robots don't sit there and need to think. So I'll give you one technique, and the challenge for you is come up with other techniques. By the way, if you solve any of this, send me an email. I'm very interested in this. Um, so this is a combinatorial um, optimization problem. And we know some techniques for how to speed up combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, one is rapid random restarts. And so what the idea here is, is that when you solve a combinatorial optimization problem, sometimes it, you, you can solve it very quickly. Sometimes it takes forever to solve. Very similar problems, sometimes it's quick, sometimes it takes forever. So it's hard to predict whether this is a problem that you can solve very quickly or this is a problem that takes forever. So instead, what you do is, if you want to solve a problem, you randomize it very slightly. So you create a bunch of similar problems and then spend, spend a shorter amount of time solving it. If you can only solve one of them very quickly, you have solved the overall problem. So that's the idea. And so that's what you see here. So here uh, we have given a multi-agent pathfinding problem and a runtime limit of five minutes. So now we use conflict-based search with highways for five minutes and we try to solve it. And you know, if we run a bunch of experiments, we can solve 76% uh, of the problems within five minutes. So there's some that we can solve. Now what we do is uh, we, we sort of randomize these problems slightly. And the way we do that is remember that initially every robot plans its path independently of the other robots. Now the way it really works is that first we plan for one robot its path, then we plan for the next robot, and we try to let the next robot avoid the path of the first robot, right? So, so as to avoid conflicts. Then we plan for the third robot trying to avoid the path of the first two robots and so on. And that's what we randomize, the order in which robots plan their path. Okay? So e e each way it gives us a starting solution. It might not be collision free, but it's a starting solution. And it changes how conflict-based search works. Okay? So, so we do that, say, five times. So we have now five different starting solutions. Each one we give a runtime limit of 60 seconds. Right? Together that gives us exactly the five minutes that we have to solve the problem. Um, uh, we solve it, and if one of these five runs solves it, we are done. Right? We, we now have a solution, and we can send the robots on, on their way. And so now we can solve 98.7% of the problems within, within the overall runtime limit of five minutes because at least one of these runs with a runtime limit of one minute finishes. Okay? So standard techniques, uh, rapid random restart, it, it works here as well. Uh, by the way, Glenn tried this out on MSTAR and says it works there as well, but not as good. Um, so so it, it seems to depend a little bit on the solution method that you use. Okay, so how, how well does it work? Um, so here's an example. When I minimize flow time with a suboptimality bound of two, we have 130 agents. Half when I move from left to right, half when I move from right to left. If we just run conflict-based search, the base method uh, from the Israeli research group, about 50 seconds. If you run it with highways, about 30 seconds. Okay, so, so we do better. Okay, maybe it's not quite a factor of two in this particular case. That's great. Okay, so it helped. We need more help. That's why the challenge problem for you is speed it up even more. Uh, also keep in mind that this is not quite real time. This will become important in a second. Okay, okay so now I want to admit to you that I lied to you uh, because when I mentioned the multi-agent pathfinding problem, what, the way I explained the problem is that you have given a robot, you know where the robot is, and you know where the robot wants to be. Right? And then you learned that it's an NP-hard problem, but we can solve it with A-star-based approaches like, like M-star, for example, or conflict-based search. There's another problem, right? There's the anonymous version of the problem. And what the problem here is, is that I give you a number of robots, the same number of targets. You have to find a one-to-one -one mapping from targets to robots. Find that first. That now assigns a target to each one of the robots and then solve the, the non-anonymous uh, problem where you need to find collision-free paths for all of the robots from where they are to the target that you assign to them. Now you have to do more work here, right? Because here first you have to assign some of the targets to the robots, but it turns out to be an easier problem. Uh, it's polynomial time solvable for mixed band minimization, and it's solved with flow approaches like the max flow um, algorithm. Uh, so Steve Laval's group and, and students have looked into that. And it makes sense that it, it could be polynomial time because you have more wiggle room, right? There's more under your control. So that's the anonymous version. 
um, of the problem. That, in practice, runs very fast. And what I want to convince you of is that, in reality, you have mixed versions, where you have like three blue robots, three blue targets. You need to find a one-to-one -one mapping of blue targets to blue robots. So in other words, you can assign this robot any one of these targets, but none of these, wrong targets. Okay? And so similarly for the red and the green robots. So why is that interesting? So if we look at the Amazon problem again, so if you have, for example, you have um, uh, two robots available and there are two shelves that need to be picked up, you don't care which robot goes to which shelf. They are completely homogeneous. You can decide which robot to send to which shelf, but every shelf needs to get a robot. Okay, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. It's exactly the anonymous version of the problem. And the same also holds if you buy you know, two goods, like a doll and a teddy bear, for example. Uh, one robot needs to get the doll, one robot needs to get the teddy bear, but you don't care in which order they arrive at the picking station, whether the doll arrives first or the teddy bear, so they're placing the arrival queue doesn't matter, okay? You can decide. So again, it's an anonymous version. On the other hand, once you have assigned a robot a particular rack, then that robot has to go to a particular picking station, the one that packs your package. Okay? So at that point in time, the robots become non-anonymous. Okay, so it's this mixed anonymous, non-anonymous problem. I call it here target assignment and pathfinding. And it turns out that uh, this is still NP hard to solve as long as you have more than one group. Uh, so it's not easier than the non-anonymous multi-agent pathfinding problem. And it's, it's also NP hard to approximate. It's basically exactly the same theorems that you saw earlier. Uh, reduction from a slightly different version of satisfiability, um, but, but uh, relatively easy to prove. Now, how do you solve these things? Okay, very simple. Um, you solve it with a mix of of a solver for the uh, non-anonymous problem, say conflict-based search, and the anonymous problem, say Maxflow. Okay, you put them together. Uh, the way you do it is simply uh, you use the Maxflow algorithm uh, within a group because they are all anonymous with respect to each other, um, and then you treat a group as sort of a meta agent. Um, and you use the conflict-based search between these different meta-agents. So very easy to do. Um, how well does it work? So uh, number of robots here, uh, runtime, and how many problems we solved uh, for this combination that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, so we scale up decently. Uh, and here is um, the one criticism, right, that whenever you say I have a combinatorial optimization problem, someone will say, why don't you use a generic solver for a combinatorial optimization problem, like mixed integer programming, why don't you just throw that at the problem? And so we did, and we tried to be smart about it. I don't know whether we really were or, or weren't, but you can see that the scaling behavior in terms of time and the number of problems that we could solve is far worse, meaning that we really utilize more of the structure than a, a mixed integer uh, programming solver could. Okay, so, so far so good. Now I want to get back to the point where you wanted to remember that we can't quite solve them in real time yet. I think, you know, give the, the research community, there are many smart people working on this problem, a little bit more time, you know, we will be faster and faster. But at the same point in time, Amazon might build larger and larger warehouses. So, so how, do we, how, how do we bridge this gap that we can't quite plan in real time? Okay, so, so to, um, to address this issue, let's just put this on robots, right? Instead of doing it in a grid world, uh, let's do it on a real robot. So we take one of these solutions that we got from conflict-based search with highways, we put it on a robot. And what happens? They crash, okay? They crash almost immediately. Um, why do they crash? Um, the reason is simple, right? We, we abstracted the problem too much. In particular, say on a grid, um, if the grid-based solution is this guy here, the green robot here, is moving you know, with full speed already, and now the grid-based solution says, you know, move in, in lockstep, not a problem on a grid, right? But real robots need to accelerate. And if we don't take into account that, that the stationary robot, the blue one here, needs to accelerate, the green robot will run into the blue robot and will have a crash. Okay? So we abstract it too much. And that's a general problem with planning, right? Planning uses models that are not completely accurate. Uh, in our case, the robots are not completely synchronized. They don't move at exactly the nominal speed. They have unmodeled kinematic constraints like acceleration here. Um, we will never get uh, planning to use completely realistic models. And we don't want to. Right? It wouldn't be efficient any longer. So that means plan execution will likely deviate from the plan. 
And that's a problem. The standard answer in AI, in both AI and robotics, is replanning, right? Some plan deviation happens. Why don't you just plan again from the new state to where you want to be? And amazingly, this has been shown in AI planning competition to be a, a very hard to beat strategy. It, it works beautifully in many real world situations. Unfortunately, this is not quite one of them. And the reason here is that if you do complete replanning, it takes too long, right? You will have a plan deviation, you know, within 10 seconds, and then you need 30 seconds, you know, to find a plan. That won't work. At the same point in time, just because one robot is slower than, than it should be, uh, you don't want to slow down all of the robots. That would be another strategy that could work. Okay? But the idea is you know, that that would be very, very ineffective. You only want to, yeah, there might now be collisions. You might have to resolve them by slowing down some of the other robots. But if the a robot is working in a completely different part of the warehouse, why slow that robot down? So we need to be smarter about this. How do we do it? And so, so this gets me um, to this execution framework. We'll use a simple template network. And what we'll do is we'll, the input will be these plans, these multi-agent plans, in this case, the path that the robot should follow. Um, and what they will do is they will determine the speeds. Also not a new idea, right? I mean, people in robotics do do that, adjust the speeds of the robots to avoid collisions. We can also take into account edge lengths because a lot of these solvers from AI assume that all of the edge lengths are one. If we want to use one of these solvers, we make a wrong assumption, and at some point in time we need to correct it, and this one will correct it for us. We can take into account velocity limits. Uh, robots have max speeds with which they can move, but we might also want to impose velocity limits in part of the environment uh, because of safety. We'll guarantee a safety distance among robots, and we will avoid replanting in many cases, but not all. So let's, let's look at how this works. So this is, again, is what you have seen already, uh, the problem that I used at the very beginning. And here I wrote down the plan, you know, how the robot should move. Uh, the green robot, that is uh, agent one, I guess, moves from A to B to C to D to E. Um, the blue robot, that is agent two, moves from B to C to F to C to D. That is the grid-based solution. Now, a grid-based solution, in many ways, is very rigid because it dictates exactly when each robot should arrive in, in each location. There's no leeway there that it gives us. And it also gives us a complete ordering between the arrival times of the robots in the locations, because the arrival times are really numbers. Now, if I want to vary the speeds of the robots, I need to get wiggle room. How do I get the wiggle room? I will relax these two assumptions. Okay? The arrival time now, real values, and will also no longer be uh, completely ordered. They will only be partially ordered to avoid uh, any collisions. So let me tell you how I do this. So the first thing that we do is we create a precedence graph. This is the precedence graph here. The vertices, the big vertices, here correspond to locations in the plan. And this one here corresponds to agent one, the green robot. Uh, this one here corresponds to agent two, the blue robot. Um, these, these arrows here, so, so an edge from here to here just says that first, the green robot needs to arrive in A, and then only the green robot can arrive in B. First, the green robot needs to arrive in B, only then can it arrive in C. Right? So these are temporal precedences. This is the same here for the blue robot. Now, then we also have these arrows here. So, so this one needs to happen before that. Why is this? Well, if this happens at the same time, this is the blue robot moving into B, this is the green robot moving into B, there would be a collision. So we can have that. So we look at the plan here and say, well, you know, this unrealistic grid-based plan tells us that here agent two is in B before agent one is in B. So we make this a precedence. First, the agent two, the um, uh, blue robot, has to be in B before agent one, the green robot, can be in B. Okay? So pretty straightforward here. Now we also have these, these little uh, nodes here. And what these are are auxiliary uh, auxiliary locations. So, so the idea is, right, we have sort of an auxiliary location delta before B and one delta after B. So that means that this, this edge from here to here, I now make from the auxiliary location after this B to the auxiliary location before this B. Why? Because what this says is that the agent two, the blue robot, needs to have left B and reach the auxiliary location, some delta, some small space after B, before the agent one, the green agent, can approach B by reaching this auxiliary location before B. 
So we can see that this will give us safety distances. Okay? Um, and then you know, it's a design parameter, uh, what the distance should be between the main locations and the corresponding auxiliary locations. Here's some small delta. Okay? So that's under your control. Okay, good. So, so that's that. Um, now what I'll do is I'll assign um, intervals uh, to all of these errors here. Where do these intervals come from? So, so let me first tell you what they mean. So what this interval here means, corresponding to this edge here, is remember a, a vertex here corresponds to when a robot arrives at a location. And so this says that the uh, agent one, the green robot, arrives in this auxiliary location after it arrived in location A. And this says between one second and infinite seconds after it arrived in location A. Okay. So, so it arrives in this auxiliary location between one and infinite seconds after it arrives in location A. Where do we get these numbers from? Well, robots have, have maximum velocities. We know that these locations are delta apart. If the robot moves at full speed and it takes it at least a second, then I know that the difference has to be at least a second. Um, so, so the lower bounds here correspond to maximum velocities. Right? And similarly, the upper bounds here will correspond to minimum velocities. We don't have them here, which is why they are infinite. But what's interesting about this now is if you look at this data structure here that we created here, this is a simple temple network. Okay? Studied them forever, um, for a long time. Um, they have very fast solution methods that find now all of the possible arrival times um, in, in these nodes that are consistent with all of these constraints. So we can do this really fast and in, in, in very simple ways. I mean, it's really, really well understood um, how to do that. And that's what we will leverage. So one way how we can, how we can do this is um, we can use a linear program. Uh, we can also find shortest path in the distance graph, right? If you know about simple temporal networks, you can do both. Uh, let, me, let me write it down as a linear program here. Um, and so the idea here is in order to minimize make, span, and flow time, we're going to schedule each arrival of a robot in a location as early as allowed by all of these temporal constraints. Right? And so, so I can, can minimize the sum of the arrival times of all robots in all locations such that all of the constraints hold, namely, you know, so that we satisfy all of the lower bounds and upper bounds of these intervals that I showed you. That's it. Good. Um, now it turns out if you put this on a robot, you need to tweak the delta quite a bit to get this right. You don't want to have these deltas too large. Uh, they can't be too large. Right? You don't, if you make them too small, it doesn't work. And so what you can do about this is you can also maximize the safety distance. Um, so you can figure out that if every of the robots moves along you know, one of these edges with some constant velocity between a minimum velocity and a maximum velocity, you can calculate the graph-based safety distance of two robots as this. Okay, remember delta y was just how, how far the auxiliary locations are away from the main locations. And this is just the minimum and maximum velocity with which a robot can move along the edge. And so, so now if, if this is believed that for a second, right? if this is truly the safety distance, then one way how to, uh, how to maximize it is, is to maximize this. Right? And so that's what we do. We use a linear program uh, now with the objective function uh, to maximize uh, this minimum velocity here. Uh, subject to all of the constraints. And remember, minimum velocity gave you an upper bound. So we need to add these upper bounds to the temporal constraints. So now I took something, right? I mean, that you probably need to look 10 minutes or add, you know, to understand. But I hope I made it, I made it sort of obvious um, that this works. So how does it work? Um, so what we do is you, you now run conflict-based search with highways to find a plan. That is slow, OK? Um, you construct a simple temple network for the plan. From the simple temple network, you use this method that I just told you about to determine the earliest arrival times in the nodes for all robots. And from that, you can calculate the speeds of the robots, right? Because you just look at the next location that they need to go to, when they should be there, and from that, you can figure out how fast they should move. So now you have the speeds for the robots. You send them to the robots. So this is a centralized system at this point. Um, the robots move along their path you know, with the given speeds. 
the plan execution deviates from the plan, instead of running conflict-based search again, you construct another simple temple network and you determine new speeds for the robots. And only if this comes back when you say, look, you know, I want to determine the speeds, and it comes back and says, I can't solve this STM, there is no solution, then you know that you need to find new paths for the robots and you need to replan. In small examples in practice, that doesn't happen. You need larger examples for that to happen. And that is still an open problem, exactly how you want to do the replanning for us at this point. Okay, so let me, let me show this to you. Um, we did it uh, in this case, well, let me show you the slides anyway. So we can do it both in, in simulation on, on VWeb in this case, um, as well as on create two robots. Um, we do use a, a motion capture system, so we have ground truth about where the robots are. We only have a small number of robots. This is the, the really small version. Ah, I wanted to stop at the right time here, here for, for example. Um, so you can see that the robots really do get closer then they should using a grid-based solution, right? Because if you look at, at these two robots here, um, so again, a bunch of robots wanna go from left to right, a bunch of robots wanna go from right to left, um, they get closer because of these acceleration constraints and turns, for example, also take more time than robot thinks because these really move at, a, at an arc uh, and we don't take that into account. Um, but we, we now maximize the safety distance between them and, and so they will not crash. And then we can do the same thing here if this thing plays. This is now a mixed, um, the simulation with the non-anonymous and anonymous robots. Okay, so all of this stuff stuff works well. Um, and so, so what we are working on now there is uh, we do more probabilistic planning. Why take every, every uncertainty into account during plan execution when you can already take some into account during planning? So, so we are extending this framework uh, in quite a few different directions. But the last thing I want to address in this talk, um, and Reed told me that I have an hour, so I have about 10 minutes left, um, is what if there are people in the audience, right? You guys, everyone here is smart. So, so if you sit there and say, this is, this is a lame problem, okay? It's just a bunch of robots um, sort of moving around. I'm looking for more of a challenge, right? For me, this is good enough, okay? But you might look for more of a challenge, and I want to give you a challenge problem. So let me spend a little bit of time on the challenge problem. It will involve multi-agent pathfinding, of course. Um, it's not our problem. Um, the problem came from an ingenious solution, uh, or an ingenious uh, system from Harvard University that you might have seen before. It's called the Termis robots. Who knows the Termis robots? Just quick couple, not everybody. Okay, good. So Radhika Nagpat's um, research group, very interested in, in behavior-based robotics, bio-inspired type approaches. Um, she, she and her students created a little robot um, here, we'll see them in a second, and each robot can pick up a block and carry it around, just one block at a time and put it down. But then the, the robots can also climb blocks, only one block at a time, okay? Uh, and so as you can see here, right, they can build a structure, they can climb the structure and make it bigger. And the idea here was that they wanted to, to recreate termites, because termites also build nests that are much larger than themselves, and that's what these robots can do. So it's in a way, if you are from artificial intelligence, right, it is sort of like a blocks world, but it's a blocks world where robots carry these, these blocks around, and that gives you spatial and temporal constraints. Okay, so let me show you how this system looks like, it's a really cool system, so this is a plaque for her research, it was a nice uh, PhD thesis that one of her students uh, wrote, so you can see how this works. One of the cool things about this from an AI perspective is that most of the time these robots will move on the blocks. The blocks are human engineered and so you can take a lot of the uncertainty out because you can put little nicks in the four corners of a block so the robot knows that it's facing north, east, south and west and so location uncertainty cannot accumulate. So you don't need to worry about really a lot of probabilistic approaches here and you can think about deterministic approaches and I think that there are very, very few problems in robotics where that's really true. I mean, very often you do need to take uncertainty into account. So this is a cool system. So you can simulate this very easily. Um, and it is just like if a robot is level with the space in front of it, if it carries a block, it can put it down. And similarly, in the same situation, it can pick it up again. Uh, a robot can, can move on flat ground. In this case, the robots only move forward, but then they can also turn left 90 degrees and turn right 90 degrees. Um, and a, a robot uh, can move up. And I should have made this robot face the opposite direction, right? If it faces in left, it can move down one block. That's it, okay? So you can write a simulator for this, again, you know, in 100 lines of code. Very easy to do. There's only one subtlety on the real robots that I haven't modeled here. Okay, so why is that an interesting problem, right? I wouldn't necessarily 
build construction robots like this. Um, but, but from thinking about planning, this is really interesting. And the reason why this is interesting is if you want to build a tower of a certain number of blocks, how do you build this? Right? You can't build it directly uh, because you can't reach this thing up there. So you need to build an access structure like a ramp Right? And then you can put the last block onto the tower, and then you have to deconstruct the ramp again. Right? That's how you would build a tower. Now, um, building a tower takes a ton of blocks and a ton of time, because the number of, of blocks uh, in the ramp it grows sort of with the square of the height of the tower. So we need a ton of blocks, and it takes a long time. Because of this, so the robots at some point in time are done constructing, you want to make them as effective as possible. Few steps as possible. So if you want to build two towers, you would not build a ramp for this tower, deconstruct the ramp, build a ramp for this tower, deconstruct the ramp. You can build one ramp in between and build both of the towers at the same time, then deconstruct this ramp, and you basically have the execution time. Right? And that only takes one robot into account here. So you need to think in a way, sort of, you know, about how to do it. And this is where the multi-agent pathfinding problem comes in, because you almost never want to build uh, two access structures, two ramps next to each other, so that a robot can move up at the same time and a robot can move down. But if the ramps are narrow, only one block wide, then again, a robot that moves up and a robot that moves down, they can't pass each other. So it won't work, which is exactly the same thing that we saw in the corridor environment in Amazon, which makes these interesting multi-agent pathfinding problems. But this one has a ton more temporal and spatial constraints about what the robots can and cannot do. Now, the, the uh, student of Radika used sort of a behavior-based uh, approach uh, in order to build only very simple structures. But you can't, you know, at least not in, in that particular solution, you can't build arbitrary structures with that. So you can only build very simple ones. Now, you would think that AI has developed, uh, you know, general purpose strips type planners. I mean, they're planning competitions on PDDL, right? I mean, sort of every two years. Um, but the problem is they currently don't scale up to what you need because the plans are very, very long and they need many, many objects, many blocks. So if you throw that at it, it doesn't work either. So that's interesting, right? Because how do you get this to work? And I'll show you very quickly sort of a, a solution that we came up with, just very high level, because I think you guys can come up with better solutions for this. And that's a challenge problem to you, okay? And all of my solution here for now will be just a single robot. I'll, I'll say in the end something about several robots. So we call it uh, tree-based dynamic programming. Um, so, um, so here's the idea. So this looks at the structure we want to build from above. If I didn't put anything in a block, there's uh, into a cell, there's no block there. Uh, this means there's one block here, there's three blocks here, right? So, so this is a tower, and this is a wall that surrounds the tower. Okay, so that's what we want to build. And I will compare this against the method where for, for every, everything is like this, we view as a stack, we build a ramp, you know, we build a tower of height one, we deconstruct the ramp, right? So, um, um, so that's the tower by tower method, it's naive. Okay? We want to do better than this. And here's the solution, uh, it's called tree-based dynamic programming. And so here's how the robots can move, right? So on an empty grid, uh, they can move north, east, south, and west. Uh, here's where they get more blocks from, the reservoir of blocks that actually exists in the Harvard solution. Okay? Uh, and we just, we just connect it somehow to the structure. We assume that you can go from here to any of these. Doesn't really matter. And now what we are doing is we find a spanning tree of that particular graph. Here's a spanning tree, and robots will only move along the edges of the spanning tree. That is restrictive, okay? It might be good to, to also have, to, to also be able to move from here to here, we don't allow it. We need to find a good spanning tree, right? So we will have an outer loop that tries to find a good spanning tree, or we'll use heuristics that find a good spanning tree, eventually. Once we have a spanning tree, though, here's the idea. Um, so the idea is that I write this tree now as a tree, right? So, so this one here is a tree, but now I really write it as a tree. So it looks like this. And I will do dynamic programming from the leaves towards the root. If currently in this node, this is a cell, right? There are already three blocks, and I have already decided that I need to go up to five blocks. And uh, there are currently two here, and I've decided to go to seven. There's zero here. How high do I need to get here? Right? It's very simple. Um, so I need to go at least to six, because then I'm on par with 
with six here, and I can take, if I carry a block, and put it down here and get to seven. So the answer here is I need to go to six here. It's just a dynamic programming operation looking at these two things. Okay? So that's sort of the underlying idea. I'm, I'm very high level here. Um, the, the devil here is, is certainly in the details. Um, but that's the idea. And then we build it in phases. There's a whole phase uh, you know, given by one of these trees that just puts blocks down. So it holds blocks, it, it gets blocks from the source, it puts them down at various places in the structure. Then there's another phase that just takes blocks away, another one that just puts blocks down and so on. So let me show you how that looks like, you know, for, for this example here. And uh, so this is how we start, right? Nothing there. Uh, there's some, some source of blocks here. This is how, how it looks like after the first phase where the robot puts down things. So this has built almost the whole wall, not quite, has built a ramp here and this tower. And then if we use this dynamic programming method uh, to take blocks away, it'll now take the ramp away. Um, and it'll then, then complete the, the wall at the outside. Right? So, so you can show, you know, in terms of number of block operations, pick up and put down operations, does not take navigation actions into account, um, that for some of these buildings here, um, like for this one here, the. Uh, uh, Disney Hall, um, compared to this, this very dumb method, the tower by tower method, you know, you're sort of an order of magnitude better. But it's not optimal. Okay? So therefore the challenge to you, first challenge, is you know, write a good planner for a single ant robot, or single termite robot, um, you know, that builds an arbitrary given structure that is specified in a grid for every cell you specify how high it should be. Next thing then is once you've solved the single agent planning problem, well, <laughs> generalize it to a multi agent planning problem where you have several robots working on the structure at the same time. Now, here, our solution here is actually quite decent. It's not ideal, again, um, but because we work on a tree, different robots can work on different subtrees in parallel because no other robot will be in that subtree. But they all have to go at least at some point in time you know, to the source to pick up new blocks. Okay? So there's some interaction, of course, going on. Um, but what our solution, for example, doesn't do is it will always task one robot to pick up a block and put it down where it's needed. It will never come up with this idea that you can form bucket brigades, for example, and hand over blocks. Okay? So come up with a smarter, so the second challenge problem, come up with a smarter problem, with a smarter solution than, than our solution. Right? And we make our planner available if, if, if people are interested in, and we also have published results. Good, okay, so, um, so I gave you sort of a little bit of an overview here on what we are working on, on multi-agent pathfinding. I didn't talk about our latest research because that's poorly understood, okay? So at that point in time, I couldn't really talk about this um, too much. I told you sort of about the parts that I think at this point we have a pretty good handle on. But if you're interested in this, you know, go and grab some of, of Glenn's uh, publications. And we have a whole project page as well, so you can go and grab um, some of our publications. And lastly, I want to mention that, of course, this is uh, not just my work. Uh, it's work of a number of, of folks. Uh, I mentioned them on the initial slide. In particular, here, Satish Kumar is, is one of the, the folks, a researcher at USC, uh, who has really contributed a lot to both of these approaches. Um, so, so that's all I wanted to tell you about. Uh, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Good questions. Don't be shy. Uh, for the multi-agent path planning, the first one. If you want to refine the plan that you found, so you found a plan in the grid world, so something that's very squarish, and you discover that you your, your agent. So imagine there's no collision somewhere, and you want to go from here to here. You discover you have something like this. You may want to find something that's more organic. You know, you know, you have to be here, and then you have to be here at some point before some agent comes here. Mm -hmm. so you have your uh, temporal uh, constraints. Can you do some refinements to get something that's more curved, something right. that would be more natural? Yeah. Um, I think we can, um, um, but not necessarily as a post-processing method. Um, uh, we might be, but uh, we have never thought about this. Uh, but if the question is, so let me change the question slightly, but it's still going in your direction, right? So, so in our case, right, we don't take kinematic constraints of the robots into account. What if you want to take some kinematic constraints into account, right? I mean, so for example, that they need to move on an arc. Yeah. What do we do in this case? Um, one idea here might be, um, 
you know, lots of people, you know, especially here at Carnegie Mellon, um, have used graphs in form of state lattices, right? I mean, to do motion planning. And so what you could think about is saying, well, you know, why do you want to do it on a grid? You could also do it on a state lattice. <laughs> right? That would allow you to, doing planning already, not in an after, um, in a post-processing step, uh, but doing planning already, you know, to take some of these kinematic constraints into account. I think you can do it. Uh, the issue there is you can certainly do it um, by introducing lots of new vertices, right? The problem is state lattices are not planar, whereas grids are. And on grids, as I said, lots of the planners assume that all of the edges, you know, I have cost one. On state lattices, that's certainly not the case. And you can address all of this, you know, by adding tons of vertices. You don't want to do that because it scales poorly in the vertices. And so you need to fold this into your planning method. But I actually think that it can be done. And that might be sort of approach that goes in, in what you wanted me to do. And I think it can be done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Going, kind of going along in that. So, you know, when you talk about um, um, modifying the plans for execution, um, you talk about uh, modulating the speed, uh, but there are spatial constraints, the kinematic constraints, and acceleration constraints you, you mentioned. And it wasn't clear that that approach, this SDN approach, is going to deal with those as well. Completely correct. We haven't thought about this. Um, and in a way, in, in the first step, so I, I'm, this is a first step, right? Um, in a first step, we didn't need to. And the reason for this is, so, so for example, right, I mean, we do have, as I mentioned sort of in the passing, right, I mean, the, the robots don't turn in place. Um, so, so they do have a turn radius. But the grid cell size is large enough that that doesn't cause problems. If the grid cell size was small, so that you leave your grid cell right, during the turn, whereas the, the grid-based solution assumes that you, you do not, uh, you're in trouble. Right? And so because of the specific setup, right, the, the robots and so on that we are using, uh, in a first step, we could get away with not thinking about this. And that's exactly what we have done sort of one step at a time. So I have no idea at this point you know, how we take other kinematic constraints into account. I think it can be done, but we would need to think about this. Within your framework? Within that framework. Yeah, I, I do not know whether it can be done completely in that framework. I, I do not know. That's why I'm saying, you know, we haven't really thought about this yet. Uh -huh. uh, so how efficient is that versus using something like a safe interval uh, that you're not using the time uh, dimension explicitly in planning? Right. Um, I don't know. We haven't tried it. Um, well, what you need for this is you, you need to know the, the t dimensions, right? I mean, the question is, you know, how much t should you model? For x and y, at least you know how large your environment is, right? Uh, but there are bounds that, that you could use. Um, you could also just impose one. If you need more, you know, you make it larger. Uh, I haven't tried, um, you know, intervals. Um, it just works so well that we never needed to think about this. Uh, intervals become more of an issue, you know, if you think about the state lattices that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, if you have these state lattices, you want to take into account that one motion primitive takes much more time to execute than another motion primitive. Here, sort of interval-based methods might actually be the right approach, right? Because that can't be really pressed into, you know, sort of a discrete grid type representation. But I think it's interesting to think about it. I don't know who was first. OK. So, talk about like, the resource allocation. For example, if one robot can bring two rocks in shorter time than the other robot uh. can. So. Um. Not in this context. Uh, in this context, I think th th there are lots of th low-hanging fruit um, in this context. We have thought a little bit about this in the context of, of sort of auctions and task allocation there, um, but not in the context of, of multi-agent pathfinding. So the question I had was that you, um, you load your plan into the STN for execution, and then as uncertainty strikes, you, the STN is used to keep the consistency of the plan throughout that. Um, but at some point, you may be getting into a very bad plan space. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of a way of approaching when you're bad, estimating when you're bad, when it's worthwhile to replan? Right. So I think to some degree we might be able. So we haven't quite done this yet, right? 
And you're completely right. You, you don't want to wait till last second, right? Because then fixing this might have to require a robot to back out of a corridor or something, right? And that's not a good situation to be in. You want to detect this early. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to replan you know, all the time. We, we think we might be able to use Slack you know, in order to guide us you know, how much Slack we have uh, you know, for certain of these events. But we do not know this for sure. Um, and there are sort of other issues if you, if you think about it, right? I mean, if you replan, you need to find sort of a sufficiently different plan, right? Even though planning doesn't know about why the plan actually failed at this point, right? Because not part of the model. The model was an I ideal problem. So, for example, you have highways that you might assign. Those highways may actually be very bad assignments given the current state of execution. Correct. So if you went back, you want to replan on a different set of highways. Correct. Right? Yes. So that would be the kind of the topological changes you make. Yeah, that, that might, might be one thing. I think there are, there are more tricky situations. Um, but the, the highways, I think, we can change them online, which is really cool, right? Because as you sort of move around, you know, you can gather more statistics and, and you might be able to change the highways, uh, both for single instance, but also over time, you know, as the traffic pattern of the robots uh, changes. Uh, but again, we have none, done none of this. Um, so again, sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, I think low-hanging fruit everywhere in this particular problem. So if someone wants to follow in Glenn's footsteps, um, I think I think there's plenty of opportunity to do it. My question is regarding the precedence graph. Uh, when we use a constant delta, we considered using a different delta for a heterogeneous system. I see. Uh, right. Uh, and the simple answer is we never worried about a heterogeneous system. <laughs> for us, all of the robots completely homogeneous, um, which basically I think is true for Amazon robots, for example. Um, low hanging fruit, <laughs> wherever you look. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you.